Let me begin with a uh, word of prayer as I get up here. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to start. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you for this class and these students. Just ask you to just bless our work today. Help us to glorify you. What we do, Lord. In your name, my brother, Jesus. Amen. So um, I have a, well, I won't go through the calculation um, with you guys because it's kind of, well, I guess the heart of the matter for this one is like if you have, if you have a spherical shell. Mass, big M. So, <clears throat> if you could imagine cutting it away, there's just a real thick, a real thin. It's just, it's just the. All of the mass is concentrated at the the edge, right? Like a basketball, right? Like the mass of a basketball is prim prim primarily what the, you know, just the rubber, right? Ignoring the air, of course. <laughs> um, anyway, so. Spherical shell, and um, if you work it out, <clears throat> the moment of inertia around the z-axis for this thing actually works out to two thirds mr squared. I will most likely um, type up the derivation of this when I write the notes, so you can look at it there when I do it. Um, you can contrast this with um, the um, formula for a solid sphere, which we derived last time, which is mr squared. So this is solid, solid sphere versus spherical shell. Um, part of the reason I won't do it in class is just like the derivation. It doesn't really involve calculus that you guys don't know, but the um, the nuts and bolts of it really does heavily require um, spherical coordinates. So that, that is, you know, not something we're really doing in here. So I'll spare you the derivation. But I'd like to have the formula to use if we need it. So there it is. All right. So just to recap, we know that if we have a, a you know, a, a, a body, ri a rigid body rotating about its center of mass, and um, we know the um, moment of inertia is I, then we have up to this point shown that the kinetic energy, the rotational kinetic energy, is one half i omega squared, right? And we got that from basically just adding up the regular, you know, linear kinetic energy of all the uh, all the little bits of mass that making ma they're making up the body which is rotating. So now I need to take the next step in this um, in this story and talk about what happens when we have you know, something that's not just rotating, it's like rotating and translating. Like, for example, this eraser, right? If I was to say, take it and throw it like that, the energy would be twofold, right? It's got like the rotational and also the translational energy, as you can see, right? Um, <clears throat> remind me to pick those up at the end of class. But, um, <clears throat> so we need to derive how that works. See, because up till now, I've only um, had the situation where we just have a single, um, a single mass, um, which is all connected together and rotating around an axis. Now I want to talk about that mass translating through space. And <coughs> because I'm sick, I will not attempt to write this on the board because it would go terribly horribly wrong. So we will look at my notes together and talk about it, okay? Um, so this is lecture, if you use your imagination, you can almost see the 26 up there. So it's lecture 26, which is posted on my website. Um, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. Oh man, there we go. No sleeping. Um, let's see if I've got my laser. Do I have my laser? Oh man, I got no laser. Oh well. Okay, I'll have to go with my low-tech pointer. Okay, so we've already derived some of these things at the start of the lecture. Like we worked out the moment of inertia for a rod. 
uh, and a moment of inertia for a rod around the, rotating around the center. Um, we worked out the moment of inertia for a, a cylinder. We worked out the moment of inertia for a sphere. And here's where we are. So here's the, here's the context. So we're thinking about some, some, some blob, some, can, you know, some, com, some <clears throat> distribution of mass. And that mass is doing two things. On the one hand, we can talk about the center of mass of the distribution. Right? A question? A question? No? Okay. We can talk about the center of mass of the distribution, and we can also talk about rotation of that body around an axis which goes through the center of mass. So we're going to decompose the motion into those two pieces, the motion of the center of mass of the distribution, as well as the rotational motion about an axis around that center of mass. And so <clears throat> if we think about a little bit of mass in the distribution, dm, it's at the center of mass plus r prime, where that's the position vector relative to the center of mass of the system. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so we can break r prime down into a radial vector and a normal vector to the axis. So in the blob, there's that little bit of mass we're thinking about. There's the um, position vector relative to the center of mass, and there's two pieces. There's the piece which is parallel to the axis of rotation we're talking about, and there's the piece which is perpendicular to the axis. There's the, the two pieces. And so as we calculate the, the velocity, of the, the relative velocity relative to the center of mass, which I've called V sub rel, uh, that's dr prime dt. But that is dn um, dt plus dr dt. Now n here is assumed to be zero because we're not allowing the mass to move like it's a rigid body, like the eraser I threw at the start of class, right? Like the constituent particles that make up that eraser, they're not actually moving relative to each other in that motion, right? They're just translating through space as a, as a composite whole. So the n is not a variable. That differentiates to zero, whereas I've got dr dt. So when I calculate the kinetic energy of dm, I have one half dm times the speed squared, but the speed is the derivative of the center of mass velocity and <coughs> the relative. So we can talk about center of mass velocity and the relative velocity. And to calculate the speed, we can take the dot product with itself squared. So when you take the dot product of the velocity of the little bit of mass, you've got three terms. You've got the center of mass, center of mass, and you've got the dot product of the relative with the relative. And then you've got this cross term that is, involves the dot product of the relative velocity and the center of mass velocity. It turns out that as we integrate this, as we add up the kinetic energy um, of the whole rotating and translating mass, this middle term, it's going to integrate to zero for reasons, well, let's, let's find out why. So, <clears throat> so in short, the little bit of kinetic energy is sort of associated with a little bit of mass I was talking about is this. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> all right, so we add up all the decays to get the total kinetic energy. So integrate that over the, over the distribution. And again, so this, this notion of integration, I'm using it as a somewhat heuristic notion. In practice, this could be a line integral, it could be an area integral, it could be a volume integral, it could be a surface integral, any of the kind of different integrals we can define over various, you know, subsets of three dimensions some of which you've seen in calculus that you've taken, some of which you haven't yet for some of you, right? But eventually you learn them all, and you should know all of them for engineering. Anyway, so, <coughs> excuse me. So we have the three pieces. We've got the integral, and, and since the velocity center of mass is a constant, right, um, with respect to the dm, like that doesn't depend on little dm at all. Um, <coughs> I can pull it out, and that just gives me one half. What's the integral dm over the whole thing? Just the total mass, right? So I get one half the total mass times the velocity of center of mass squared. That's the translational kinetic energy of the object. Uh, and then this right here, we've actually been talking about in the previous class. This is the one, this is the piece that which gives you the one half i omega squared. This is the rotational kinetic energy. And then this piece over here integrates to zero by the next slide, all right? So long story short, what we're going to learn as we go through this derivation, is that the net kinetic energy is two pieces. It's got, you know, for a rigid body that's rotating, we c the kinetic energy has the um, 
the translational kinetic energy, which is just one half m velocity of the center of mass squared, and m is the total mass, and also one half i omega squared, all right? Which is the new thing, right? That's the, the brand spanking new thing here. We, don't, we didn't have before this rotational stuff. So, <clears throat> I think this is just pair, this is just saying what I just said. So here's the, you know, we went through this calculation before, here it is again, all right? I did it before in the context of a single blob just sitting there rotating around a central axis without motion, right? Like I talked about a Christmas tree, I think. Because everybody thinks about spinning Christmas trees, right? That's just a natural example. I did see a video of a guy who like threw a Christmas tree off like an eighth story of like an apartment building. He managed to do it like straight and like it just planted itself in the ground, just like boom, and it just stood there. Oh man, stood there. Oh yeah, man. Well, you ima imagine it just stood there, I guess. All right, so here's the little technical piece, but let's go through it. It won't take but a minute. Why is that integrate to zero? <clears throat> well, we're integrating um, the, the relative velocity over the mass distribution. So our prime is the position vector of dm relative to the fixed origin. Script r is like this, right? And our prime is like that. And there's the position of center of mass. So I think what I do is I switch out our prime for the difference of like script r and big r. Yeah, and that's, that's all you need because when you do that, then you've got the, basically this is the integral of the position vector over um, times dm over the, over the, uh, over, the over the mass distribution. But that, that's exactly the center of mass. That's the definition of the center of mass. We integrate dm times the position vector over the thing and divide by m. That's the center of mass. So that's why this is, this is exactly mr. And this over here is obviously also Rm, and so they cancel, and yay. So that piece is zero. So yeah. So in summary, if we have um, something moving with both rotational and translational kinetic energy, we have to do a sum of both the kinetic, the rotational, and the translational kinetic energy. All right, let's see here. So let me, um, let me put this away for now. I'll try to, I don't know. I mean, I'm gonna try to write out an example. <laughs> I'm not, not super, super confident it's gonna go well. I think my energy is waning this week. If I have to, yeah, I will take one for the team in N class early. Yeah. I mean, you deserve it. I deserve it. Oh. Well, when you put it that way, when you put it that way, see, but you have to understand, I was, I was raised, I was, I was raised by by professors who 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 who, who operated differently than the ones you're used to. Uh, raised by math teachers. See, I had a. Okay, so let me put it in context for you. I had a course in general relativity that met once a week for three hours. It took us a lot of lobbying to get this course to go because it hadn't gone in many years. So we had made a petition and finally begged and pleaded and cajoled the math department into offering it. And it was me and my friend, Crazy Paul. But then Crazy Paul wouldn't come to class because he was too busy beating up children every week. So in context, he was working at a dojo. He doesn't like it when I talk about it this way. But we know what it's about. So. You know, I assumed those were with the word crazy that, you know, just to, well, I don't know. Well, I mean, he, he, he's. You know, he just hit his hand against a pole to try to get it, you know, more, uh, you know, toughen his hand up, these crazy karate people. Oh, <coughs> Things, like oh, no. <coughs> Things like that. Things like that. Uh-oh. So, 
<laughs> Let me finish this stupid story. And um, so we had this relativity class once a week. And we got there. And mind you that the room that this class was in, because it was a small class, it was like 25% of the size of this room, right? The professors at the front, Dr. Kafitz, he's Russian. And he's just a little guy. And um, smoking his office and stuff. I love Dr. Kafitz. But he was up there and he was coughing like from, from the bottom of his diaphragm up to the top. The sweat was just running off of his nose. Like he's just profusely sweating, right? And we're like, Dr. Kafitz, you, you don't have to lecture. It's okay. He's like, no, I must go on. So if I stop this lecture for a, for a, for a stupid cold, I mean, it's for shame. I would be, I would be, dishonor, I'd be dishonoring. I would, I would, I would, I would be dishonoring the memory of, of, of Dr. Kafitz. <coughs> so, so here's an example. Yep. All right, guys. Please stop talking. Thank you. So suppose we've got an inclined plane. We've got a solid cylinder at the top. All right. And so we'll we'll make this a solid cylinder. But once you understand this, you could we could change it. You could swap it out for like a a bowling ball, like a uniform, uh, like a solid sphere, right? You could swap it out for like a basketball, like a spherical shell, um, any of those shapes we've done, right? You could do. And so it's solid cylinder and mass m radius r, all right? And the height of this hill, let's say, is h, all right? <coughs> and we're going to assume that it rolls without slipping. And there's also something called rolling friction, um, but they don't pay me enough to teach you guys that, so I don't. And um, I mean, I'm just joking. This class is enough trouble already. Let's not bring that into it. So <clears throat> rolling without slipping, which means that without, we don't account for rolling friction which means that rolling without friction is, is a conservative process, all right? Like no energy is lost. Um, it just changes form. So <clears throat> we can think about it rolling without slipping down to here, all right? And after it's you know, rolling, it's going to have a certain angular velocity omega, and of course also a certain translational velocity, let's say Vf. Well, I guess we could just call it V since there's no V. We're going to assume, I'll, I'll find a VF. V naught is what? Well, let's make it zero. Let's suppose it's starting from rest. All right? So rolling without slipping, what does that mean? That means, and we could call this omega F. That means that <clears throat> VF is going to be equal to R times omega F. That's the rolling without slipping condition. It says that... And what that's coming from really is just saying that the arc length subtended by a point on the, uh, on the rim of the cylinder, if you were to follow that point and just lay that path that it makes out straight, S would be equal to R theta. So if you differentiate, you get V is equal to R d theta dt, which is V equals R omega. Anyway, rolling without slipping means that the tangential velocity is equal to the radius times the angular velocity. Okay, so then... In this situation, it's not just like the problems we had before, which we just did what? We had some dumb box, and we just let it slide down the hill, right? So we only had the translational kinetic energy. There was no rotational, right? So what's the story here? So energy at the top, right? Energy initial is equal to energy final. <coughs> we should be able to find um, the velocity, right? Or the angular velocity at the, at the base of the incline using energy conservation, all right? So the initial energy is what? It's just MGH, very good. So MGH, what's the final energy? We've got, we got rotational and translational, right? So we have, 
1 half m v squared. By the way, is the tangential velocity of like a point on the rim of the, well, the, the tangential velocity of a point on the rim of the cylinder which is rotating is the same as the velocity of the center of mass in this context. Right? So v, the, the velocity of center of mass and the velocity that couples to the angular velocity, they're the one and the same in this problem. So 1 half mv squared and then what? Plus 1 half, 1 half i omega squared, right? But then the question is what is i, right? And what is omega? And of course, <coughs> ay, ay, vf omega f. So we worked it out, right? We worked it out. So we've got 1 half m. Let's, let's solve for vf. Let's get rid of omega and trade it out for v. If I trade omega for v, what do I got? What's that? Omega f is what? Yeah, vf over r. So I've got plus 1 half. My i, it's a solid cylinder. We've worked that out. That's 1 half big M r squared. That times uh, vf divided by r quantity squared. So you notice the r squareds, they be canceling. And uh, what you got here? You got a quarter plus a half, also known as three quarters mvf squared, I think. We worked it out. So like the integral of its um, It's, uh, it's in lecture 26, it's example 5, but we worked it out in class. Um, okay, so, so then what? Well, if we want to find VF, solve for it, right? Oh, the M's cancel. Woohoo! All right, so VF apparently equals to the square root of 4GH uh, divided by 3 in this situation, right? What's the uh, final angular velocity? Yeah, omega f is what? Oh, we just divide that by r, right? So, so 1 over r times the square root of, oh, don't tell Dr. Sprano I didn't take the 4 outside of the square root. I'm sick. Okay, anyway. Yeah, you guys, yeah, I can, your lips are sealed. All right, very good. You can tell them for sure. Um, <clears throat> and I, I admit I am violating my policy of putting everything in terms of decimals. Like I said early on, I'm aware of the hypocrisy. I'm still going to take points off your stuff if you don't do it. But not always. Just enough to keep you on your toes. What? It's just good parenting, right? Yeah. Inconsistency? As the oldest of seven, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Oh, that seven. Seven. Seven My youngest seven. brother is two years old. <laughs> you have seven kids. I love I love the misinterpretation. That is <laughs> deliberate and hilarious. No, because my age gap is very big. My four brothers are oh. two years old. Oh. My youngest brother is two years old, and the oldest brother is seven years old. I am filled with small goblins just in the house. Small goblins, all right. <clears throat> that is why my oldest consistency is so important. Because if the two year olds can do what the three year olds can, and the four year olds can, then you might as well just have another one small. All right. I have another result to share with you from the slides. So let's go back to that. Thank you. I'm pretty sure it was brought to you by some sort of AI generator. But mm. Mm. have I told you guys about my dream of um, the Star Wars being redone by uh, by AI? No. And no. <laughs> what? Why not? I mean, uh, well, like. I would rather, I would rather instead of AI, I would like seven-year-old brother. Because you are basically the greatest duelist 
choreography in the entire world. <clears throat> you're not, you guys aren't hearing me. Some of the original actors are far too old and cranky to do the movies again. Others are dead. Others are like too politically damaged to be interesting. Oh, so you want like uh, AI Christopher? I'm saying that the, the last, the trilogy of movies, it could be redone uh -huh. as it should have been done with AI. And you don't even need Disney's permission. Your idea is very good. Disney's permission to use their intellect. Not if you do it anonymously. It's still a name professor. It's still. It's like Harry why are you guys like so interested in like upholding like Disney's property rights? What are you like? I am not. I don't care. My father was a lawyer. Your father was a lawyer? Okay. I guess I guess I'll allow it. My father was a pirate. No. It's not not true. My my father was actually a doctor. But anyway. You want to steal a tea. But once you get past Okay, fine. We can wait for Disney to give up the IP after they run into bankruptcy after yes. another 10 years or whatever. Well, it's only one version. My point to you, though, is the larger point is that as AI is going to get better, there's no reason we can't fix mistakes that have been made in sequels in the future. This is one of the things about AI. We can actually make a good Some things you say don't make sense, but <clears throat> anyway. Um, <coughs> All right. I know you guys want to start the break. So do I. Let me finish this. So another theorem that's important to know about is the parallel axis theorem. And what it concerns is how to find the moment of inertia of a, of a given body w with respect to an axis which is parallel to the center of mass axis. So if you know the moment of inertia with respect to the center of mass axis, you can calculate the moment of inertia with respect to another axis which is parallel. And the formula is just this. So the moment of axis, moment of inertia with respect to the parallel axis, A2, is equal to the moment of inertia through the center of mass axis plus mh squared, where m is the total mass of the object and h is the distance between the, the uh, axes, which of course makes sense because they're parallel. And the proof is down here, which you guys probably don't care about, but <clears throat> I will look at it nonetheless. So to judge whether or not this is a reasonable formula, we have to look at the kinetic energy from both perspectives. So if we're rotating around A2, then the kinetic energy is 1 half I A2 omega squared. On the other hand, we can write the kinetic energy as 1 half M uh, v, v center of mass squared <coughs> plus 1 half I omega CM squared. And <coughs> So if I look at that, the velocity of the center of mass is h omega because their h difference, and if the one is rotating at speed omega, then v is h omega. And then, <clears throat> and then you just do algebra and out pops this formula. So there you go. This is just a useful, what this means is that we can take all of our inertia formulas that we have. And so for instance, if we're instead of like rotating a sphere around its axis around a diameter, if we're, ta say, rotating the, rotating the sphere at an axis which is outside the sphere, then this is how we find the moment of inertia for that. Essentially, we just add, it, there's, it's like, it's very simple in some sense. It's like, it's almost like we add another moment of inertia as if it's a point particle at its center of mass, right? Because the moment of inertia for a mass that's a distance h from its rotation, um, ro you know, the axis of rotation would be mh squared, right? mr squared is the moment of inertia for a point mass. <clears throat> Let me show you an application of this. Like, oh, by the way, here's, you can also, you can also relate the moment of inertia around two parallel axes, which, which axes which are not center of mass axes. That's how they're related. I never use this, but there it is. Great. Um, <clears throat> so here, <coughs> ah, yeah, that's, that was the idea. Um, so. So if you have a barbell, um, length L, you can ask what's the moment of inertia about that as you like, this would be more fun if I actually had one to like spin around my thumb or something, right? I need to get some like fake weights for physics demos, right? You could throw them at the students, stuff like that. That'd be good. Yeah. All right, so, 
So anyway, I can figure out the moment of inertia for a, um, a sphere, a solid sphere around this axis because that's parallel to the center of mass axis, right? So I do the distance, which is L over 2, m times L over 2 squared, plus the moment of inertia of the sphere around its center of mass axis, which we worked out last time was 2 fifths mr squared. So as you can see, you got your 2 fifths mr squared plus your ml squared over 2. Why do you have 2 times that? Well, there are two barbells, right? So one for each side. And there you go. That's the moment of inertia for this system. If you were to spin it, 1 half times that times the angular velocity squared would be its kinetic energy. All right? So that, that's, there's a practical uh, implementation of the parallel axis theorem. All right. So I think, I think that's about all there is in lecture 25. Let me put this away here again. I, I have typed up like another four pages of notes. I just keep forgetting to post it because I'm not thinking clearly lately. Um, but I should have like another 10 pages of notes posted sometime soon, which you can read and study or ignore. It's kind of up to you. But I think they're probably helpful. Some of you told me the notes were helpful, so I'm trying to type more of them. Um, <coughs> So the next topic in here that we should talk about is torque. What is torque? How do we define torque? What, what's torque about? You don't know what I'm torquing about? Are you sure you're not a dad? Let's see here. That sounds like, sounds like a dad joke. Let's see here. Now that I'm a pseudo you're a pseudo parent. <coughs> I don't know why, but my sister cannot change the schedule of the life of her. Mm. <laughs> no, we're the oldest too. We have to take care of the <coughs> seven-year-old. You guys are. So, <coughs> excuse me. Definition. <sighs> Um, <laughs> given an origin, um, uh, a mass m at r has torque. If you use, you use tau for torque, equal to r cross f. Um, from a, uh, an applied force F. So if you apply a force F, the torque from applying that force is given to be M, excuse me, it's given to be R cross the force. Why the cross product? I mean, I don't have to explain it to you. That's the definition, <laughs> right? So, um, but let's let's talk about it. what's what's the what's the idea here? Why do we why do we make this definition? So, um, let me draw a picture. So, if we had sample three, so here's like my point origin. And I have mass here, right? Suppose I have a force applied like that. All right, so the um, at R, so this is the radial arm, as it's called. Why is it called the radial arm? I don't know. I'm sure there are historic reasons. It is the position vector of the mass we're talking about. But in this context, people start calling it the radial arm. Um, anyway, so if we take our right hand, right R, and then we cross it into F, my thumb points out of the board. All right, so here, R cross F points out of board. <coughs> So what that means, this is the right-hand rule, is that that kind of force is producing a twisting motion, 
where my thumb points in the direction of the axis and my right hand curls in the direction of the, the implied motion. See that? That's what it does. So it tells you how that force is going to make it try to, try to twist like that. So that's the um, axis of rotation caused by F. Now, I, I'm not saying, I'm not, so I, I should be clear, I, I'm not saying that that rotation has to actually happen because there could be other forces implied, right? There could be more than just this force. So like the net torque would be a sum of the torques of all the different forces which are at play. Um, but if this was the net force, then I probably could just say the, ro the rotation. If that was the net force, then there would be a rotation, all right? Oh, example three, example four rather. What if the situation was like this? So here's my origin. Here's my mass. Suppose the force is like this. So the torque is R cross F. What's the situation here? Remember we talked about the cross product? It's been a minute, but we did. Remember that? Yeah. Would that first vector be F or R? Oh, I warned you. I should have warned you guys. I, thank you. Goodness gracious. It's not a good sign. Um, <clears throat> so R and F are parallel here, right? So what's, what's the cross product of a vector and a parallel vector? Zero. It's zero, yeah. So this is equal to zero, which, you know, I usually at this point go to the back of the classroom and like pull on the door directly out from the axis of the hinge, right? What happens? Nothing, right? But if you press on the door perpendicular to the axis which it rotates, then it, of course it makes it move, right? Torque is getting that idea that that perpendicular perpendicularity is what it takes to produce a twisting motion with respect to a force, right? That's why the cross product is the right mathematics here because it captures that notion of perpendicularity. The cross product is biggest when R and F are perpendicular, right? What's the formula? Remember earlier in the course we had like torque. Well, we didn't have torque, but earlier in the course we had A cross B, and the formula was like the length of um, the length of R, right? Times the length of the force, which I'll, I'll use my stupid double bar notation for a second here, times the sine of the angle between them, times n hat, where this is the unit vector. <coughs> Excuse me in direction um, given by right hand rule. Right? So what would happen if instead of the force pointing that way, what if we pointed like example five? Um, so I take a point, here's my, my mass again. Instead, let's make the force point like that. Let me carve out a spot here. So I do R, I cross an F. Now this time, I have to turn my hand over, right? In order to curl into F, my thumb is pointing into the board. So here the torque, R cross F, points into board. Right? So by default, we take an axis out of the page as like the positive direction. So um, rotation that's with respect to the axis coming out of the page by the right hand rule is a counterclockwise rotation, right? So, so this the rotation here would be like counterclockwise. You know, over here we're getting, you know, it, it causes a what? A clockwise rotation. See the difference? I mean, it's fairly obvious if you just think about the, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the radial arm being pinned at the origin and what the force would make the mass, mo where the force would make the mass move. So, any, any questions? What are the units of torque? Jo yeah, joules, that's right. Now, <clears throat> there, there is a professor here who, who get mad if students say that the units of torque are, are joules. He insists that they're newton meters. 
I, this is this is a philosophical comment. Like I, I I don't know how to parse it, but some people some people feel strongly about this. I'm not I'm like not joking. Like some people feel like no, the units of torque are newton meters, and okay, I kind of see the point is that 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 like respects the origin in terms of r cross f as a formula, but newton meter is equal to a joule. So I'm with you, joule. So torque is, <coughs> excuse me, the units are energy, but it's a vector. So that's kind of weird, yeah. So if, a, if the origin isn't vector, how do you figure out what part of the force goes to torque and what part goes to translational motion? Oh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I'll have to think about that for next class. But um, I'm only thinking about torque with respect to a fixed origin. So I don't know how to answer your question right off. But maybe that question is answered by the larger. See, there's, a, there's yet another derivation that I still haven't done for you guys, which is to show that for a, um, you know, a system of uh, a collection of masses, um, we can talk about, first of all, we can say we can prove momentum is conserved. Um, or we, could, we can prove that the, the, the dB dt, blah, blah, words, words. <laughs> so we proved that dP dt, right, was equal to the net external force, right, for like a system. There is a corresponding theorem for angular momentum. There is this theorem, like the net angular momentum, it turns out, is equal to the net external torques. Uh, the net external torque on the system. I have a suspicion in that derivation, maybe we can address your question. That might actually be beyond this course, your question. I've got to think about that. I'm not sure we really deal, deal with that in here. Because I've, for the most part, I don't think you'll find any um, question that you're asked in the homework anywhere where we are applying, a f I don't think we're, I don't know. I'm not sure about that question. It's a good question. Let me think about it. But I was the, the rest of the sentence I, that I was saying, but I didn't finish saying, is just that the problems about torque involve a fixed origin, as far as I can think of. Um, but if you find one in the homework that's not like that, let me know, and then I can maybe I can focus my energy there to try to explain that better. Um, hmm. Oh, so <clears throat> I guess this. As long hey, you got me on it. So, what's the definition of angular momentum? For a point mass, for a point mass m with velocity v relative to origin, um, you know, so, you know, m again at R. Angular momentum L is defined to be, well you could go different ways. You could say it's M R cross V. That's one way you could define angular momentum. The other way you could define it, well you could bring the M inside. See that? What's MV? Momentum, right? So this is also R cross P. So what happens if you differentiate dl dt? What do you get? For a point mass, we've got d dt. What do you guys think happens when you t differentiate a cross product? How would that go? Well, I'll tell you, the answer is product rule. But you have to maintain the order of things because the cross product's not commutative. So what we got here is dr dt cross p plus r cross dp dt. Right? Okay, but remember that p is just equal to mv, which is really just m dr dt, right? So that first term is the cross product of a vector and a scalar multiple of a vector, so that's zero. The first term is manifestly zero by basic properties of cross products. And the second term is R cross what? Now, 
What, what is DPDT for a point mass? We worked this out a couple weeks ago, right? It's the net force, right? Newton's second law in momentum form is F is equal to DPDT. So this is the net force on the mass. And what's this? What do you think net torque should be? How about that? Yeah, this is the net torque. So lo and behold, dl dt is equal to the net torque. This is the rotational analog of Newton's second law. The time rate change of the angular momentum for a point mass is given by the net torque that acts on it. <coughs> so if the net torque is zero, angular momentum is conserved. And then there's all kinds of, well, see, we, we don't, conservation of angular momentum for a point mass is not that interesting. This becomes more interesting when we extend this discussion to distributions of mass and we do the derivation, which I haven't, haven't done yet. And I don't think I actually have that written in any PDF. I need to type it up for you guys. But anyway, have a good break. I will stop. Thank you. Yeah. You gotta actually like speak up. <sighs>